of Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk, a Torah Institute podcast. Torah just means instruction in Hebrew. At Torah Talk, we will make straight the ways of Yahuwah and discuss the simple truths of Scripture so that even you can understand and get all the juicy life hidden within the pages of Yahuwah's Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. <laughs> Good evening, brother. Hey, hello. Let me turn the volume down a little. Wow. Good to see you. Yeah, you too, mate. All right. How's the, how's my volume? Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. Great. Awesome. Well, yeah, that's very awesome. nice. Well, Shabbat Shalom, brother. Yes, you too. <laughs> Let me Wonderful. see. Morning, sister. Evening. Hello. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm just getting the phones out of here so they won't be ringing in the room with you. <laughs> yeah. People are calling from all over the planet. Yeah. And possibly from uh, maybe even in orbit. You never know where they are. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, we had a wonderful week, and uh, uh, Phyllis is uh, so thrilled with uh, the new car that she was able to achieve, and or you know was given to her by Yahusha. And I got my tooth fixed today. Nice. Well, it wasn't fun, you know. But uh, I had a filling fall out, and it was an old filling. It was probably the very first one I've ever had. And I think I got it when I was still a teenager. And I remember the dentist that worked on this particular tooth. And he drilled way too much. And the hole was, it was, it was all the way to China. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we call it. Anyway, uh, the, the lady had to remove uh, a little more with some drilling. But uh, I, it's wonderful. It's not cutting me anymore. See, the sides of the tooth that is missing a filling are real sharp. And uh, my tongue was, I was talking funny, and I, and my cheek was getting a kind of rough spots on. And, and it just feels great, you know. Isn't it amazing when they clean your teeth and you realize how dirty they actually were? And you run your t tongue on it and you go, oh, wow. It's like porcelain. <laughs> yeah, it's it is. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. You look very sharp, brother. You could come and work in the salon. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I could probably pull a, pull off a gig like that. Uh, you know, I could play a little guitar and cut a little hair, Yeah. you know, and uh, learn to play the trumpet, you know. Yeah. I haven't learned to play the trumpet. I, I played a little trombone, a little flute, yeah. you know, and uh, I don't need a lot of space to do it. But uh, is that black or is that deep purple? Not the band. Oh, it's a really dark blue. It's a really, really dark blue. It's lovely. Yeah. It's a, just a regular shirt. You had uh, mentioned that we might do a news thing, and I was getting ready. If I need to throw on a tie, then I could do that. And then I guess we'd uh, have to pose. <laughs> like this. Like we're on the, yeah. at the desk. Yeah. Isn't that it? Yeah. Like, the, like those dancers that move their legs. <laughs> oh, all right. Or oh, yeah, yeah. Or I could sit in the chair backwards and put yes. my arm like this. Yeah. And then that that would be the desk. Yeah. You know, we could do that. Yeah. Is that what you want to do, or you want, what do you want to do? Yeah, yeah. I uh, I hadn't really planned anything for today about it. I, uh, oh. I don't have any uh, current event info, but we can do oh. you. <laughs> but you do. Oh well, yeah. But here's the news. Uh, <laughs> Wonderful thing has happened. Uh, I had my tooth fixed, and well, actually, uh, what has happened lately? I don't know. Um, you know, just basically, uh, the news is just filled with uh, political stuff over here. Like, you know, and they're trying to throw a lot of distractions in. Like, wait a minute, look over there. This person's having some kind of sex scandal, and you know, that's the next thing that's going to happen to me, probably, is or you. Uh, you know what they're doing now? You know. 
It's been for, they've been doing it for two decades. Oh, man, you know, the stuff that people can imagine uh, <laughs> to blame people for. But uh, at least that hasn't started. Yeah. 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 But, uh, wow. yeah. yeah. <laughs> what you wrote to uh, Chris and Victoria was really nice. They shared it with me. Uh, oh, did they? Did they? Was was it? No, how they would take that because I, I know that uh, our, we ourselves would would be faced with that kind of dilemma too, possibly. You know. Mm. And, uh, well, they said to me, uh, Chris said he realised that he he said, "What do you think of the test I've got in my hands, Mark?" I said, "What do you mean?" He said, uh, "I've got to do it the right way so that they can see." And I went, "Wow." Well, we're all called to do that. So, yeah. Uh, well, Romans 12 is the key guidance that I got from Yahuwah on the uh, methodology. And, you know, and, and it really disturbs our peace on the Sabbath if we're constantly trying to correct other people on every little detail about what they're doing or not doing. And... I just unless they're you know making a just just you know, like getting a bass drum out and marching around and and uh, or going out and sawing wood for hours, I uh, or you know electric saw and there's just the neighborhood is screaming, our lawnmowers are blazed. I, I'm thinking, well, you know, cut the grass some other day, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you if you would, but uh, they aren't going to be like that. I mean, his son, uh, what's his name, Matt Matthew? Yeah, he's not going to do that, you know. Go out and start working and chopping wood, you know. Yeah. I don't think, yeah. you know. Mm. I don't think he's defying his father. He he was, you know, but he would uh, certainly appreciate a, a roof over his head, you know. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, that's what I would more than willingly provide my own children for sure, or anyone that was, you know, in a serious situation. And even if they were an unbeliever, you know, and I think the commandment is is not saying so much that you're not to allow them to work, but you're not to make them work. You're not to, you know, like make your animals work. But if your animal wants to do something like spin around in a circle for an hour, and you just, what's that about? You know, you don't say, wait a minute, you're violating Sabbath there. It's, it's really what we're doing, you know, and what we're causing others to have to do. You know, employees, slaves, animals. Uh, you know, and we and like you were saying, uh, the, the the people that have the responsibility of caring for animals on the Sabbath, they have to do what the animals need, and no more. That's amazing because we had uh, we've often pondered. Uh, well, we actually had somebody a few years ago come and live with us. They call it an au pair to help look after the children and work with Amy and she was from Russia or something and didn't speak very much English and we thought she understood that you know we do the Sabbath and uh, when she found out she's like oh no I'm not doing that you know I don't do that and uh, that's not my religion and uh, we're like yes but the scripture says everybody under this roof has to and so that what you just said is amazing uh, don't cause people to under your roof to, to work Yes, and uh, you know, an employee or a servant or a slave or property that you own uh, that wants to do something out of love, that's an autonomous decision and they can do things. As long as they're not being paid for that, you know, you're not paying them. And that's why it's, it, it's so odd that the Yahudim will actually pay who they call Goyim to come into their house and, and turn on lights and, and uh, various things. And yet, that's not allowed in the command. Yeah, specifically uh, forbidden. But uh, it isn't like it's hard to understand or anything. I mean, you know, a child can understand work. You know, uh, I was trying to explain the physics of work, but the, uh, it's something about boiling water to a certain temperature, raising it a certain temperature, uh, one degree uh, within a certain span of time is a certain you know, a level of uh, energy, but uh, energy expending, expending energy can be, I mean, if you're playing and playing ball, pitching and catching and teaching your children uh, Torah and uh, using physical examples maybe and you're, and you make somebody run this way or, 
you know, or you're playing a little game. On the Sabbath, that's really what it's for. You know, it's not uh, intended to be for, uh, you know, putting other people to work, you know, making, mm -hmm. causing them to work. That's, you know, one of the little things that we've thought about is what if the mail is in our mailbox that the mailman put there and we go out and pick it up? Is that work? Well, we aren't, we aren't causing them to work, so probably technically we're not. But if we put mail into the mailbox, and the mailman's coming by anyway, and he picks it up, then we did cause somebody to work. You know, there's a, see the subtleties of it, yeah. but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as far as somebody working and we're listening to the radio or something, or the television, a lot of people would think, well, you know, those people are working on the Sabbath. And a lot of times they're just... You know, certain radio stations, they have uh, no one really manned there. They're just broadcasting all the time. They didn't turn it off or turn it on. They just run the tapes, you know. But, of course, I don't want to hear commercials either, you know. So, you know, I, I, but I do listen to the news on the Sabbath, and uh, I know somebody's reading that, and they're probably being paid. And, you know, those are troubling things, you know. But I'm not mm -hmm. causing them to work. No. I just no. happen to be... You know, electromagnetic fog or smog, and uh, my radio is on, but I'm not working. But somebody is is broadcasting, and my radio happens to be picking it up. And, uh, I don't know. It's it, it's really troubling, uh, you know. But yeah, we're not making anybody work though, because they're already doing that, you know. But we're not it, because our radio is on picking up the transmission doesn't mean that. Yep, you're doing it. You're causing those people to do that. And I don't think so. You know, but no more than the sunshine that's shining down on you. You know. Yeah. Well, there was a brother that made a comment on our uh, tour talk from last week, and he, I think he said something to the effect of, uh, "It's snowing, and the only way I'm heating my house is with a fire or a combustion or something like that." Does that mean I have to freeze on the <laughs> <laughs> what would you say to that? Oh, you mean if he had not started a fire in yeah. preparation and he was starting to get really cold. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, that would probably be something that a person would probably be wanting to do in preparation for Sabbath, knowing that it's going to get cold. And I'm sure that's what uh, the best advice is, is to have a candle. Or some fire that's already going in a safe place, uh, or a fireplace that you just keep sustained, and you're not going out chopping wood, but you've got the wood already chopped, and it's ready to just throw into the little stove or the fireplace, and uh, just sit, keep it sustained. You know, put a few things in there every couple of hours, and you know, walk away, and uh, you can arrange it so that it burns slowly. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can keep an eye on it a little bit from time to time, uh, but to say, well, this just snuck up on me and I'm totally surprised by it. How did that happen? And the, that's just, uh, you know, not really preparing right. You know, you're not preparing for the Sabbath. Yeah. And then yeah. the next week he can say, you know, I remember being cold last week. I would probably sit there and be cold. I just put on more coats and put on a couple of pairs of pants instead of one pair which I often do anyway. In the winter, I did, I'm a real cold person. I, I put on some flannel uh, pajamas or something and then put pants over them. And I'll walk out in the winter and I'm, oh, I'm fine. You know, uh, I wear it indoors, outdoors. In the winter, when it really gets colder out here, when it's like uh, zero degrees or below, you know, below, uh, not zero degrees to you is freezing. I mean something way down, you know. Uh, Fahrenheit, it's 32 degrees when it freezes, but when it gets down to zero degrees or 10 degrees above freezing, above uh, zero, well, I uh, usually wear double layers of everything. But uh, Do you get snow? Oh, yes. We see serious snow usually. Not as bad as New York or Michigan or, you know, North Dakota, but... We see a lot of snow, usually uh, in a typical year, a uh, typical winter. We usually don't have snow on the ground all the time, but we've had some where we've had it the majority of the time. But um, 
about four times or five times during the year uh, because winter lasts 13 weeks. I don't know if you've ever done the calculation, but uh, uh, the, we have, uh, I think there's four, there's only two seasons. There's, there's summer and there's winter. Of course, I'm freaky. Uh, you know, there, in the Hebrew, there's Koref, which is winter. And that occurs, you know, when this um, autumnal equinox occurs. And we think fall is arriving. That's, to me, that's winter. And the uh, winter is starting. And then you have Kayetz, which is what we call springtime. But the way the world thinks, there's four seasons. And there's a band called the Four Seasons, too. A music group. Uh, they have a song called Sherry. I kind of like that. It's really old. Um, anyway. <laughs> The, the, but the four seasons, there's 13 weeks in each season. So I just, I don't like winter. I really don't like winter. I like all the other seasons. My favorite seasons, of course, are spring and autumn, you know, if you want to think of four seasons. But I, I really don't like winter. And what I like to do is think, I only have to endure this for 13 weeks. And, uh, you know, it went to, when winter really occurs here, you know, it's uh, serious. You know, and when it occurs here, it's usually around December 21st, you know. Yeah. So, Phyllis and I were just talking about that. She's uh, looking, to, well, we've, we've had snows as early as September. And, you know, and that happened when I was a paper boy, when I was a young boy. And then, uh, you know, I, I delivered papers so I could pay my way through school and, you know, have, you know, my musical interests taken care of. I had to buy guitar strings and and uh, occasionally a guitar or an amplifier. And uh, you know what we had to do is we had to work for our money. You know, anyway, the my parents didn't give us hardly anything. And, and you know, I mean, they fed us, they housed us, they put clothes on our backs. They did it wonderfully. But uh, as far as anything outside of that, we're kind of going to have. They they really raised us right. You know. But uh, in the wintertime, uh, usually it doesn't snow until sometime in December for us. So, uh, but I've seen some pretty serious snows here. Uh, three feet is about the deepest, but we haven't seen one like that in many, many years. But we'll see 10 inches to a foot. And most commonly, we just get three to four or five inches. But winter is uh, not one of my favorite seasons. But you're going into you're in springtime, yeah. Yeah, we never get snow here unless you go to the actual snow fields down south. We we never see snow. So uh, it's, yeah. Um, so what does snow mean to those who have to live in it? Is there special preparations you have to do, or is it what, what, living in snow? How do you open your door? How do you drive your car? How, what how does that work? It's not fun. I mean, there's a lot of people that are not prepared for it, and it doesn't matter how many years they've been driving in it. But it's uh, walking in it is dangerous too, you know, because the well, the parking lots and at the stores they usually have those scraped off, and the snow is just piled up, and the people have to navigate it around, and you know, the, the melting snow, you know, and they put a lot of chemicals down, you know, salt or some kind of, uh, you know, chemical mixture that will keep everything from freezing. And, yeah. you know, yeah. that way uh, people can walk around without, you know, hitting black ice. But um, it's it's just not a really fun thing to do. <laughs> but of course, I mean, well, black ice is uh, what they call uh, ice that's just where rain or ice or uh, snow has melted and there's a thin sheet of water and that thin sheet of water freezes and then it's just black ice that's what they call it because the road the roadways are black and the and you can't see where the black ice is because most of the road might be wet and you're driving along carefully and then hit and then you hit black ice which is where Maybe something is just really cold and it freezes. But the chemicals usually keep that from happening in most cases. But that's what happens with a lot of trucks. Uh, these big semi-trucks, you know, they have the big container and then the truck in the front. And it'll be driving along and it'll hit black ice. 
and the trailer will come around and try to pass the truck up. You know, and big wrecks happen, huge problems. That's mm -hmm. black ice is a is a major problem. That's the worst problem. Mm -hmm. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. Living in but the ice itself, the ice itself isn't really black. It's yeah. just what you call it because the road's black, the road, the pavement, and you can't see where the, you know, the actual ice is, you know. Mm. Oh, the is black, but, you know. Well, speaking of snow, we're actually standing in a massive wheat field today. Beautiful. Sun in the background, wheat field, you'll appreciate that this time of year. It's, oh. it's gorgeous. Amazing. Yeah. So of course, look. it's like green stuff to me. <laughs> so, it's not appropriate. <laughs> Talk, we're always yeah. talking about the harvest. So, I uh, Yesterday, I had a call, and of course, I've been praying to Yahushua about... Uh, getting some kind of local interest in the truth. And uh, we do have a meeting coming up. The seminar is coming up day after tomorrow, the first day of the week um, at 10 a.m. at our location at 2303 Waterson Trail, you know, Torah Institute HQ. Anyway, uh, that's coming up, and it's going to be the war in heaven. Anyway, the uh, phone rang, and Phyllis took a call from a lady who was looking for a book for her boss. And her boss is Jewish, and she's a Christian. And she happens to work at this radio station. Let's see, it's a local radio station called WGTK, which is also uh, uh, somehow in the same office with another Christian radio station, um, WFIA, which is a station that I listen to many times a day. I listen to it's 900 a.m. I think it's on FM too. Anyway, I listen to a lot of that, and uh, when I when I listen to the people teaching and so forth, I'm usually uh, you know we have to tweak the names and get the correct words in our head. But they're using all these wrong terms, but you know, no condemnation. It's just uh, what they do, and uh, but you know I'd love to get some of those people on our team, and and have them. A little bit more corrected, like Priscilla and so forth were and in the Book of Acts, you know, to kind of guide them a little bit, give them a little bit of correction, and and, and show them the correct terms and things that are not so offensive, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I uh, have been praying about that. Anyway, this lady named Rebecca, uh, her name was Rebecca, was talking to Phyllis about this book or any book that we might have for her her boss. She said, well, you all are, are kind of a Jewish uh, bookstore, aren't you? And uh, she said, well, uh, we actually are. Let me, let me explain a little bit about it. And Phyllis was explaining a little. And she said, well, she got more interested all the time. She said, you know what? My boss is a psychiatrist, and he would like to interview people from time to time on his radio show. He has a radio show once every week for an hour, and she invited me to be on there. She had never talked to me. Well, anyway, I called her back uh, because Phyllis told me that she wanted to talk to me about maybe what we would do. And she was very interested in the fact that Christmas was coming up, and she wanted me to get 15 or so questions that I might like him to ask me about Christmas. So that would be a wonderful opportunity. I hope it turns out. Mm. But it isn't going to happen until probably the 11th or so, or maybe later, but the 11th of December. So that'll be fun. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, if, if you think of any questions, let me know. <laughs> okay. And that goes all over Louisville, does it? Or why not? Oh, yeah. yeah. Actually, they're also on the Internet, so the whole world, you know. We'll hear the radio program, but a lot of Christians do listen to the podcasts and and to the radio show live. So that would be really amazing to reach all those Christians that are listening to the primary Christian radio station in this community, and of course around the world too. But you know, I've got a few questions that I've started on three or four, and uh, one of the questions is. Is there a curse 
involved if we bring a tree into our home. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. <laughs> yes, there is. And um, anyway, it's going to be a marvelous opportunity. What is the what is the curse specifically? Well, there's a there's a scripture that says, "Do not bring." Uh, you, you know, Amy did a special on this. Yeah. There, yeah. do not bring in a curse, any accursed thing into your home, or otherwise you will be accursed as well as it. Hmm. You know, he will curse you, um, and and that's that's what we are seeing when we bring out an abomination into our home. And Yirmiyahu chapter ten talks about it, you know, you go out into the forest, you cut down a tree, you bring it into your house, you decorate it with silver and gold, and you prop it up so that it does not topple. What in the world could that be? You know, it's a, it's a tree, and it's specifically identified as an abomination, you know. Mm -hmm. So this would have to be, uh, you know... I, uh, I I think what we should do is we should find that verse. Uh, I know Jeremiah or Yermiyahu is one of them. All right, this will do it. No, that's not done it. I've got one here that says, I mustn't have, I've brought up Amy's festival, Japanese festival. Do not, yeah. bring, do not bring a detestable thing into your house. There it or, is. I'm going to look at that word, detestable thing. I just, I didn't put the reference on it. <clears throat> yeah. Deuteronomy 7, verse 26, was that one I just read. Deuteronomy 7. Verse what? 26. Oh, that's it then. Yeah, but, search, oh, there's so many. Yeah, it says, neither shall you, wait a minute, let me get another translation. Um, 7, verse 26. Yes. Now, and you, and no, and do not bring an abomination into your house, lest you be accursed like it. Utterly loathe it and utterly hate it, for it is accursed. Mm. Of course, it's talking about the very sorts of things that we're looking at. And it might be uh, anything. I mean, you walk into a house and you see something that would be an abomination to you. And uh, that would include many things. Uh, you know, some people consider any pictures of any kind uh, to be an abomination. So, you know, that's a, that's their conscience, and that's what they have to lead. So they've got to go by what they are led to believe. But uh, what he's really referring to here are carved images of their mighty ones. That he's re That's the context that he's talking about. And, you know, that's funny because... Um, you know, many of the uh, instances that we read about, you know, like um, Laban's idols were stolen, you know, and <laughs> hidden under the saddle. And uh, that's kind of uh, uh, certainly appropriate, too, because if you've got household idols that are, you know, uh, from a pagan source, of course, there are no idols at all involved with the truth, but if you've got idols of any kind like that and you know that you bring in into your home for protection or whatever you know uh, then you're that is an abomination some of the uh, oriental people have this little figurine that they put down that looks like a little doorstop by their door it's a little uh, sometimes it's a little dragon or something or another and it supposedly protects the doorway you know from uh, whatever demons mm. and uh, I don't know if anybody's ever seen those. I happen to blunder into them when I walk into somebody's home or a, a business. In fact, sometimes you'll go into these businesses that are owned by Orientals and maybe notice something sitting there that you go, what is that? And there's incense burning on it, you know, and it's some kind of a figurine, some statue. So you want to help them and go, wow, that's not going to help you. You know, they're, they're actually burning the incense to, uh, as a prayer to their deities in order, I guess, to have good business or, or protection, you know. Mm. But, um, Very sad. Yeah, it is. It's so sad. And they're, they're, they're trained from children, and as we all are, 
when you train your children up in the wrong way, then it's really difficult to kind of get them to break those habits. Those are mental fortresses that they've, patterns that they've chosen to believe. And that's and, you know, things like Santa Claus and, and the Christmas tree and the wreath and the little bunny rabbit and rolling eggs and hiding eggs in the field. Those are really hard things to break. They're strongholds. Mm -hmm. And uh, when people think, oh, you're, you're depriving them of such joy. You're depriving them of the lake of fire. You know, that's what you're doing. But, you know, it's Inter just uh, tough. Interesting thing you said that a couple of weeks ago um, about, uh, it was about death, I think. You might have said it in the seminar. Um, Yahuwah doesn't act straight away. Like people who mock, uh, you know, they mock Yahuwah or they m mock us or, you know, and they say, well, he hasn't struck me down yet. You know, well, he, you were saying he doesn't act immediately. <laughs> he, uh, no. yes, I remember when I said that, I was discussing the uh, death seminar. And there was an actor named George Carlin here in the United States. And he was very popular. Very, uh, um, well, you know, his language was a little, you know, colorful. Uh, we wouldn't want to speak like that, but he was uh, very, uh, you know, uh, flippant and defiant of the laws. And he said, there's seven or so words that you can't say on the radio or the television. And he would say them real fast together, <laughs> you know, and he thought that was fun. It wasn't, but uh, improper. Anyway, the thing of it is, he was, uh, I forget, you can probably find on YouTube where he defied or challenged, uh, you know, he called him G.O.D., uh, to strike him down if he's there, you know. And that is a very, very strange thing. Imagine his, he felt something inside of him, in his spirit, when he said that, because he thought, well, you know, it could happen. You know, but he probably didn't care, because some people don't care. They're really against Yahuwah. You know, they're really their hearts are hardened against him. And uh, most people are just lukewarm, or at best, and they just say, "Well, I'm living the way I think I should live." But at Deuteronomy 12, we are. I think it's around verse eight. It says that something like, "We are not to you are uh, you do not do as we are doing here today." You know, everyone doing what is right in its own eyes. Is that the is? Yeah. So we don't want to live according to what we think. And you know, the, the chat that I had with Rebecca, the girl that I called back about the radio show here in Louisville, she was uh, she kept me on the phone. I'll bet for an hour. Because she just kept the, the conversation going, asking me questions and I had more questions. Very intelligent lady. And uh, apparently, but she had a, you know, a lot of the strongholds. And we were talking about the Sabbath at one time. And I, uh, and she said, well, I feel, and that was the way she expressed it, I feel that he just wants us to rest one day out of seven. And I said, well... That would be fine if you could find a reference or scripture where it actually says that, you know, mm. instead mm. of just feeling your way, you know. And then I mentioned this text of Deuteronomy 12, you know, and we're not to worship him. I think it's starting in verse 28 through 32 of chapter 12 of Deuteronomy, that we're not to learn the ways of the heathen and serve him in their way. So if we learn something that's a pattern, that is modeled from somewhere else and we just adopt it and we say, well, we're not worshiping those false deities. We're worshiping Yahuwah and we're doing it in this process that we learn from them. See, that's, he says that specifically. You're not to learn what they're doing, how they're serving theirs, and then serve me in that way. So we're not supposed to do that either. And that's very important to me. Uh, that I mean, I, when I first understood what was going on, that uh, that really affected me, because I was reading and I was thinking, well, that's exactly what we're doing, you know. And 
that's offensive, you know, to him. But you see, he gives you his mind, the renewing of your mind, which is in Romans 12. The renewing of your mind means that you're not using your old mind anymore. You're using his thoughts. And when he puts his thoughts into you, then you stop thinking like you thought, and you don't care about what you think. You think about, well, what, what is his perfect will? And then that, that's what you pursue. And you actually pant for it. You, 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 you're, it's your heart's desire. You know, and, and you know, you know, but to other people, you're going, well, why don't you see this? It's, it's given to you to see it, and then not, it's not given to someone else. Even as much as you might want to and explain it in a hundred ways, they will not accept it. And that's not, it's not any failing in yourself. And that's why, you know, at first I was thinking, well, it must be something I'm doing wrong. Or maybe I'm not expressing myself right, but it's not that at all. You know, it's a it's a deafness, it's a blindness. You know, because people are in they're they're in a compartment, and they can't get out of it unless he releases them with the truth, because the truth will break down the strongholds. You know that we're imprisoned in, and that's what I was telling Phyllis yesterday. You know, when you read these scriptures, it says, releasing of the prisoners. Well, in, in a great way, it's not so much people that are in prisons, but in prisons of their own thinking, their thoughts and reasonings. When you get released from that thought prison, that's a wonderful thing, you know. Your mind from, controls everything, doesn't it? Your body oh, does yeah. what your mind tells it to do. It's, it's your... Uh, yeah, it's your central processing unit, and everything outside that you do or say is based upon what started in your mind. And so sin starts there, too. Mm. Yeah. And obedience starts there as well, you know. Yeah. But we have to, you know, figure out a way to be gentle with people that are outside, and that includes our own spouses and children and our friends and neighbors and co-workers and everyone around us so that we're gentle with them and kind to them and not making them feel like we're judging them. Because that's the first thing people say is, well, you're judgmental. No, it's not that at all. I'm not saying anything. It's just the words that came out of my mouth are, are scripture. And the scripture is the thing that divides between the joints and the marrow. And, the, you know, it's like it's Hebrews chapter four, you know. Like and they don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It refines. Yeah. It's just an amazing thing. There's just no end to the interest. I, I can't get enough of the scriptures. There's no end to it. It's infinite. Yeah. Tell them everything happens for a reason. <laughs> yeah. That's the poor lady's prophecy. <laughs> oh, yes, I read that. That was very good. Wasn't that clever? I like that. Yes. And that song that you read today, that was, I mean, that you sang, that was so awesome. You know, uh, I want to give you, a, when I read that, I had to leave a, a comment. I was thinking, you know, it's like Yahusha is singing through your body. You know, wow. it's in the, words, the words that came out. Mm. And that was what I was saying in my comment on YouTube, because mm. that was so, you know, expressive of everything that he is, and he he just gives away himself, mm. and 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 how many people want to receive him, mm. you know, and get themselves out of the picture and say, well, you know, we're filthy rags, our all of our thoughts and actions, you know, and and just put him in there, install him. And then let him have his way with us, you know. But uh, he's ready to give himself to everybody. Oh, isn't he? Yeah. 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 He's so sharing and giving. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was thinking when you do your recording, if you were standing, you would your voice would be more uh, expressive and capa the capacity of your breathing. Because you can't do it when you're sitting down. 
you know, no. as much as I would like to think you play guitar, yes, but not standing. I mean, you can't sit and sing. But if you stand and sing, you can really throw some energy into that, you know? Yeah. 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 You'll hit all the notes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah hit yeah. the notes just. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, you still brought tears to my eyes. You know, well, I was just, oh, man, this is great. I, I try and gauge it. If it brings tears to my eyes when I watch it back, I think, oh, that's Yahusha. Whereas if I just think, oh, yuck. That's oh, yeah. it. That's how, I, that's how I try and gauge a song because uh, if, if I want to cry when I listen to it, I think, oh, that's my, that's that's not me. I'll use that. You know. It's not you. Yeah. No. So. All, yeah. That, that, you're, all the things that you've done uh, have him in them, you know, in a major way. Hmm. Well, Chris was saying to me, you've seen what Lou does. He just listens and, you know, Yahushua taps him on the shoulder, get out your pen. So he said, why don't you do that, Mark? Just then you'll, you know. And so I I had that song in my head for a couple of days and I thought, oh, gee, I like that song. Every time I hear it, I go, gee, they're a clever band. I'm not even really a fan of you 2 but I just I uh, just love the, the older stuff. And, uh, then the, then the new words just floated into my head, and I went, oh, imagine if it was sung like that. Oh, yeah. I'll have to do it like that. So. And then we get to last night when I'm actually trying to do an arrangement, and I'm listening to the U2's arrangement, and I'm going, oh, my goodness. I'm depressed listening to They've just got so much uh, stuff in their arrangement and all these. I don't even know. There's a little machine that they stick on the guitar. It's an Ebo or something like that. I've never even heard of it. And it and it resonates and it makes this this like a feedbacky noise. That's how they do that sound in with or without you. And I'm, all these effects and stuff they got on the song and I'm going, Oh, what am I gonna do here? So yeah. you know, I just throw it all, all the sounds up in the air and watch where they land. And uh but uh oh it's that was an experience with Yusha last night, coming up with some sounds. I enjoyed that. Yeah, it takes me on a journey. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, they had a little uh, gizmo that they literally called a gizmo that they put on the back of a guitar near the bridge, just where the string started, that would have six little spinning rollers, like little rubber. They were probably a little bit like hard rubber. And they wore out pretty quickly. But they would just spin, and they would. It was like bowing the strings, like with a bow, and that's a very interesting thing. All you had to do was like put your fingers on the frets, and this little gizmo would just sit there and do this, uh, you know. <laughs> and it was very interesting. That sounds a bit like what this thing is. Maybe they've, but it had a little, oh, it had had a little LED light in it, so you could see which note it was sitting on, which string it was sitting on. Uh, maybe they've updated the design. I don't know. It seemed to be picking up the string and just making it hum, you know, like a feedbacky thing. Yeah, uh, that's probably a very similar device to the gizmo. The, the gizmo was what they called it back in the 70s. Yeah. Uh, Gottlieb and Cream were two artists that were members of a, of a band that came out with this little box set album. And they used this gizmo in it for the first time in recording, as far as I understand. Uh, anyway, it was, a, it was one of the first uses of the gizmo. And it's just like that, probably. But uh, tomorrow they've got synthesizers, synthesizer guitars that are really expensive. And they can make just incredible sounds, you know. But... Uh, yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to remember the name of their band. It was uh, Gottlieb and Cream. Those are the two artists. It was their last names. But oh boy, you know, there's so many things that have been washed out. And that's good. I mean, I don't need that. I mean, a lot of data that I don't need. But, you know. Well, that's exciting about the radio. Hope you get on the radio. That'd be great. Get it out for more. <laughs> That would be so exciting to, to be, not so much for me to be on there, but to hear someone talking the, the true uh, facts, you know, because they're so indoctrinated with their 
understandings. You know, the, the, and I think that the reason that she was wanting me to be on there for him to interview me would be to, his name is Dr. Uh, Stanley Frazier. Uh, and he's got a radio show on there every week, and everybody at the station respects him. He's a psychologist or psychiatrist, and uh, maybe he can maybe maybe he can help me. But he's Jewish, and, we, and but I asked one of the gentlemen that I was over at the station today, dropping off a couple of books, uh, two copies of Fossilized Customs, uh, you know, so that he can speed read you know, one of them, and she can do the, th the same, so that they can kind of get a, an idea of where we're coming from, uh, the Nazarene. Not and it's just like a door just swung open, and Yahushua's going to allow information to pass into the people that I've been praying for. Because, see, I want, I mean, not I want, but Yahushua want, wants us to be linkage to bring together the two houses. I want, I mean, not I want, but Yahushua want, wants us to be linkage to bring together the two houses. You know, because the Torah is not over there with the Christians very much. And the Torah is over here with the, with the uh, rabbinical people and the reform people. They know what the Torah is, but they don't have the Messiah. So we need the Messiah. He, well, his guidance is going to bring them together so that there's one body. And that's going to be great. Anyway, that's, all, that's what I pray for every single day. You know, that somehow the two houses will bring, be brought together. And then maybe there's going to be more energy put into it, more notoriety. And we won't be, uh, well, we'll always probably be a really little flock. But... You know, there's going to be a lot of resistance, but as long as we're not throwing stones or acting angry, and we're kind and and gentle, and and, and we show the fruits of the spirit, you know, and not the fruits of the world. It'd be wonderful to have more workers, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah, it would. It really would. And people that are in agreement, you know. Yes. As long as, uh, well, even the Nazarene, they they seem to have a lot of disagreements, you know, over a lot of things. You know, some of them are turning into, you know, uh, lunar sabbathers or getting drawn away after something or other. And uh, you, you got to accept them, but, you know, they're they're just in another place right now. And you, you know, unless two agree, they can't walk together, you know. It, it, and, but, you know, you don't want to speak ill of any particular person. You know, don't mention any names. Start saying, you know, there he is. Uh, just uh, say, well, this is a teaching that's errant, but, uh, you know, I mean, the Jehovah Witnesses are out there. They've got a lot of truth, you know. So if they advent Adventists, they've got a lot of truth. The uh, thing of it is we just got to, we have to get, the, you know, be facilitating to get them together rather than trying to be divisive. Hmm. So that approach is probably going to be, bearing fruit eventually, I hope in our lifetimes. Yes. But um, the way the world's going, I don't know if there's going to be very much lifetimes left. I mean, this, uh, you know, when Iran gets a nuclear weapon and, you know, Israel is in jeopardy. And, Quick, put your tie on. <laughs> You're talking about the news. <laughs> oh, Matthew, Matthew chapter 24 is all yeah. around it. You know, what we could do is we could have a news broadcast of Matthew 24. That, that would be, be a basis. Yeah. Because mm. every time I listen to the radio, I go, well, that sounds like Matthew 24. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. The Matthew 24 files. Matthew 24 oh. tapes. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So you're all geared up for war, are you? Ready for battle. Oh, uh, I hope so. I hope so. You know, I don't have any preparation that much for that. I just sort of, I uh, try to keep it really, really sl uh, slim down. But then he keeps waking me up in the middle of the night, and I'm writing these notes down, and then pretty soon, uh, 35 frames builds up to about 60 frames. And I'm going, how am I going to get through that in one hour, you know? But what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to just say, well, look, listen, everybody, we're going to just blaze through this. And you're going to have to just, you know, I'm going to have to read this as fast as I can and not waste very much time. And then have any discussions at the end of it, you know, so that we don't have a lot of stopping and going, and stopping and going, <laughs> getting off topic. But let's let's get through this first, and then we can bring in other ideas, you know. I, I think that might be what we'll do. But, uh, yeah, it is, it, there's a lot of data on the war in heaven. I mean, you know, because, <laughs> wow. I've never heard it discussed. Never heard it discussed, that topic. So I'm really well, excited. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, well, it's, you know, it, it started with the dragon, or, you know, it wasn't at the dragon at the time, but if you can just picture in your mind Yahuwah being worshipped by all of his creatures, the angelic host, you know, and he's got this covering Malachim, the one closest to him, his, his special friend, I mean, really close to him. Can you imagine how heartbreaking that was for Yahuwah to lose that friend? You know, to have that friend turn on him. Well, anyway, if you were that, if you were that Malachi, and he, and you would see all these creatures worshiping Yahuwah, and you were right there, and you saw it all coming right at you. Well, eventually when he would be maybe somewhere else, the Malachim would go, there he is. And he would get the same honor, possibly, or close to it. You're number two, you know, or whatever. And, and then he says, yes, I am. And then he, he loved that. He drunk in that. And that pride swelled in his heart. And it wasn't humility. It was, yes, I'm great. And he really was, you know, beautiful, intelligent. He had everything going for him. And then to fall for pride. And then uh, carry away a third of the stars or the heavenly beings or the spatial beings. And deceive them, deceive them for a long while. Letting them do what they should not have done. The thing that was improper. To worship him, you know. So I, I, I mean, this is a fantasy in my head. There's no, there's no text on this. But I'm just, you know, I, I'm not going to cover this in the war in heaven. But that's something that probably was a germ that started it. And then at that point, when they were thrown to the earth, all these demons and and the and the head demon, uh, you know, taking over here and deceiving the man who had sovereignty, the man and, the, and his wife were in charge. They were eternal creatures too. They weren't going to ever die, but he, they were warned that if they did disobey and eat the fruit of this one tree, then they would die on that day. And of course it was the same thousand years. So anyway, but the deceiver was there to draw away, you know, and make them deceive, lied to them. And, um, uh, he was already an enemy of Yahuwah, you know, but how would they know that, you know? But, the, you know, the thing of it is, the woman said, well, my husband, of course, would say, she learned that from her husband, that Yahuwah said that we are not to eat of this tree, nor are we to touch it, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, that's where it started. And so the war on this planet, you know, began... Uh, and it was basically, and I'm going to bring this out very clearly, that it's not a territorial issue, but the real key to the understanding is that the war and the, and the winning of the war and the losing of the war is in the minds of people. It's in the mind. It's, that's, the, that's the ground, the battlefield, the battleground. The battleground is not the moon or the earth. The battleground is, is in the mind. And when we don't know who we're worshiping, when we don't identify who we're worshiping, then that thief can come along and steal the identity of the Creator, just as he did in the beginning with the fallen, with the with the when he deceived the angels, 
Mm-hmm. Obviously, these one third of the angels or the messengers of Malachim uh, were deceived. That that had to been what he did. So he would have done the same thing and deceived them to think that they were looking at Yahuwah. You know, yeah. and it would be the same thing. So uh, that's what he's doing here. You know, so why would he do anything differently? And uh, anyway, the battlefield is is in the mind, and the people are controlled by their own thoughts. The strongholds that they have built in their head, mostly by their the world, the world system of religions and processes, and the people understand things a certain way, and they have built themselves in a prison of their own thoughts, their own thinking and their own understandings. So whatever they feel they need to do, uh, they're going to do that. And uh, that's the thing that we have to renew our minds with, as Romans 12 talks about. A renewing of our minds, that's where the battlefield is. Therefore, the territory that the enemy had can be overcome with the truth, and the truth will set you free. See? And that's basically the war in heaven in a nutshell. And I'm going to go into great details too. And then the process of knowing who we're worshiping and serving is linked directly to his name. Because he's taken the name out and put in uh, other things, anything but the true name. And therefore, it's very important. And there's a central question that's asked in one of the Psalms. Who is the Elohim of esteem? The answer to that question is the key to the whole matter. Because when you know who the Elohim of esteem is, then by name, then you you have overcome and you are on the right side of the uh, battle, you know. And, you know, Eliyahu or Elijah had that very same thing to overcome. When he was in Mount Carmel, there were 950 prophets, and they were all so sure of what they were doing, and they were cutting themselves, and blood was splurting out. They were so sure of what they were doing, and so dedicated to what they believed. And then, watch it stand back, now watch this. And then he called on the right name. Instead of the Lord, he called on Yahuwah. Bam! You know, it was over. <laughs> you know, that's an interesting thing because they literally do still call on the same name that the 950 pagan prophets were calling on. They called him B-A-A-L-G-A-D. That would be the Lord, G-A-D. Okay, <laughs> let's put that together in your head. You're going, oh, wait a minute, that's what they're saying. And the translators are in, 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 in large part responsible. Because if people were printing scriptures with the true names in them, and they were sending those overseas to Africa, then, you know, wouldn't that be great? Instead of sending the error over there, you know, printed in the scriptures, you know. Because see, the supplanter, the, the imposter, you know, the one that stole the identity of Yahuwah and all the things that Yahuwah did, when you read the book and it's not him, Psalm 23 says, B-A-A-L is my shepherd? Uh uh It doesn't say the Lord is my shepherd. It says Yahuwah, Boim, Yahuwah is my shepherd. And that makes it all different. It's the key of knowledge. You know, and it unlocks it. So who is the Elohim of esteem? You know, is it is it the Lord? Yeah, uh, yeah it can't be. That's an English. Yeah. The key of knowledge implies just thinking. It implies that that's the first step. You don't even have access to any kind of knowledge if you don't have a key. <laughs> and so they lifted themselves up on all this stuff, and they don't even have. They haven't taken the first step yet. I was thinking about the armor of light, and he was waking me up in the middle of the night a few nights ago, and I was considering and meditating on the armor. And of course, it's the indwelling of Yahushua's mind, his mind in our 
in our hearts. But it has uh, relevance to the warfare and the armor that a soldier would wear. You know, the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth and uh, the feet of shalom. And, you know, and you're wearing a helmet and you've got a shield and you've got a sword. Well, the only weapon of offense that we have is the sword. And the sword is the word, which is the covenant. And I was thinking, well, what's the very first sentence? I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. Bam, there it is. That's the tip of the two-edged sword, you know? You know, man, that'll mess you up. And that's the way that it tears. That's what I felt when I remember him coming into me. I felt like I was being pierced, just like the, you know, the guys were in, in the book of Acts. It was like there was something, in, it was going straight into me, like a sword. And I, and I just went, whoa, huh? You know, <laughs> because I surrendered. You know, that was what the, the starting point was. It was uh, 35 years ago or something, I don't know. I don't know, 20, that was, I forget, no, it was 25, about 25 or 26 years ago. And I was, I was around 35, so it must have been, yeah. Anyway, the thing of it is, that, that tip of the sword, that sharp point, is right at the beginning of the covenant. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. Now, if it said something else, like the adversary has already done this, he's taken the tip of the sword off, and he's put B-A-A-L on there, you know, the Lord. Oh, boy, in the translations. And we were all trained with that, you know. Yeah. But he opened our hearts and our minds. So that is the real serious part of the war. And you can't go into the battle with that without the armor. And you can't go into the battle unless you've taken the oath of conscription, which is your immersion. When you go... And you're immersed in the name. And people that are not immersed in the name, I encourage them to go ahead and get immersed again in the true name. Mm. You know, Yahushua mm. HaMashiach. Call on that name. And that, uh, because Yah is our deliverance. And, and when you understand what it means, it really makes a big difference. <clears throat> so uh, then you're, 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 you're a soldier, you know, in the war. And, uh, you know, it's a wonderful thing. And he protects us. He says over and over and over, he says, I'm with you. I am with you always until the end of time. You know, well, if he's with us, then who can be against us? And that's the difference that was in the hearts of Caleb and Yahusha or Joshua. Uh, that when they went into the land and they saw the giants, they said, Wow, these guys are nothing compared to who's with us. Mm. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It's oh, true. He, he was, they probably had pity in their heart. <laughs> going, oh man, these people are hurt. Yeah. You know, and the other ten spies were afraid because they failed to consider. They were looking at their own uh, engineering and their own might. Yeah. You can't do that. It's not my yeah. power. Mind. When when you look at the your own life and you some days you you have these pathetic complaints and oh it's hard doing this and it's hard doing that and oh why do we do this and why do we do that and then you talk to you know while you're cutting hair you talk to clients and stuff and you realise that he really does look after us because we are not going through half the things people out there are going through in their day-to-day -day lives. Things that we might think are an inconvenience or bad are just this nothing. The people are in just so much, you know, pain. And the stories they tell are just so horrible and you just want to pick them up and hug them or shake them or something. But half the time you can't because you get in trouble. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, it's just, yeah. the scripture is true. He really does look after us. Yeah, it says in the in the Proverbs that the Torah will look after you. It will protect you. It will protect you when you're sleeping. It will protect you when you're waking up and when you're going out into the world. The Torah is uh, the, the defensive parts of the armor, you know. 
and it protects you. But it's also the offensive tool as well. So when you use the scripture on them, then they, they, they may act like nothing happened. But it went into their heart, and they felt it. And they're never going to ever get over that wound, <laughs> you know. Because the, uh, well, the demons flee when you use that, too, you know. And you said uh, about protecting us in our sleep. When the boys, they have nightmares or uh, they have dreams and they wake up all scared. I just, I'd say, say well, that, that could be a Nephilim or that could be a spirit or that could be, you know, tell them. I said, just say, I love you, Husha, go away. Because I said, demons are afraid of you, Husha. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to do anything. Just say, I love you, Husha, get, get lost, you know. And uh, you can go back to sleep. <laughs> well, what I recommend people to do uh, is not to even speak to the demons, but to um, to, to just speak to Yahusha. Okay. And when you when you're in a conversation with Yahusha, there's not going to be any demons butting in, especially when you're having a conversation with him. Mm. You know, oh, that's there's Yahusha. And that's what I do. And, the, and when I talk to you, Husha, about possible demons that are affecting people around me, what I do is I pray to him to please, to subdue them, send them into the abyss, and hold them there until the day of judgment. Please do that. Not to get them out of the present situation and let them go bother someone else, but to just go ahead and carry it forward and say, please, would you please put them in a, in a holding place, a forbidding zone, somewhere where they'll have to stay and wait. And then he probably answers those kinds of prayers. And then that way the demon's not going to be able to come back and bother somebody else or, you know. I, you know, I'm just saying idealistically that would be what I would recommend, but it would be uh, the next step anyway. That's wonderful. I love that. Yeah. You know, instead of addressing a demon, we're not supposed to have conversations with demons. No. Uh, I read uh, the Deuteronomy 18 and Yeshayahu or Isaiah chapter 8, I believe it is. And we're not supposed to have conversations with spirits, you know. Mm. Even the kind are the ones that are on our side. You know, if we have Malachim guarding us, which we do, they're, we're not supposed to have conversations with them. You know, let's go get some tea or let's have some coffee and have, have a little chat. You know, <laughs> you know, but uh, they're watchers. That's what they do. And they watch yeah. over his uh, people. And uh, sometimes, they, you know, it, it's just something that they, they do. And uh, I think there's a text that talks about uh, the women are, when they're in the assembly, they're to have their head covered for the sake of the watchers, you know, the, the Malachi. You know, I guess it's you know, an authority thing, you know, so that because they have a covering and they uh, want to see that we respect that covering as well. So that we're not going, making them think, well, if they don't bother with that. Why do why they not do that? Uh, you know, and I, and I uh, see no harm in that. Uh, if a, if I if I'm with my wife, then I am her covering, you know. But if she's yeah. out, uh, you know, separate from me, she she needs to remember that she has a covering. But you know, a physical covering is uh, sometimes people put a, a scarf over their head. But uh, you know, it's uh, it's not going to do any harm to do that. But you know, I don't have any. Uh, qualms over people that don't, but, uh, you know, it's the idea, though, that the, the husband is the covering for the woman. And her hair is also a covering. But uh, there's a lot of people that, that have opinions and strong ones about that. And uh, But, you know, what? it's more about uh, instead of enforcing all kinds of rules where some people that teach won't even let people in unless they have certain things that they have on their body. Mm. You know, they have to be wearing certain things. And I'm not like that. I just say, well, you know what? Love, and if a person's hungry for the truth, that's more important. 
And if, if they are led to do something that they read in the, in, in the scriptures that they want for themselves, that they want to adopt, then that's fine, you know. But uh, imposing rules and things like that, you know, like you're going to be uh, better because you're wearing a, a certain color or a, a hat. I don't know. I don't see that coming from anywhere. You're not being better. I mean, he, he, he created us naked. And we're born naked. And we're, we're not taking anything out of the world with us. You know, like if you're uh, buried with uh, a load of diamonds or gold or something, you know, it's not going to be with you. The pharaohs thought they were, they were taking it with them. But uh, we take nothing. We, the only thing that we can take out of this world is the Torah. Yes. I can't think of anything else. Well, yeah. If you've got the Torah, you're, you've got the covering. You're... You're protected. The Torah protects you. Hmm. You know, you're uh, you're not protected by any armor that you can make out of uh, titanium or some uh, hard metals. You know, uh, that can't stop the bullets. You know, yeah. death death is imminent. You know. Yeah. But uh, it's wonderful. Yeah, the war in heaven is going to be an interesting one. Hmm. There's well, so many scriptures about that. Hmm. Oh, pray it goes well, buddy. Great. I hope so. I hope so. Mm. You yeah. know, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say that uh, I haven't felt any kind of inspiration with that Edwin Starr song yet. I like listening to it, but I haven't really had any uh, thing come to me yet. Have you, had any, have you heard any other war songs? I don't know if that one's going to be a winner or not. No, but I hear it a lot on uh, a lot of bumper music on radio shows and things like that. They, uh, in fact, just today I was driving and I heard this radio program, some bumper music that they put on, and that song was right there. It was a very original recording by Edwin Starr, yes. and uh, I was wondering how they get away with that. You know, how do they manage that? It's a national show, and they're playing other people's music that I don't know. I can't imagine that they just called up and got permission. So, you know, how do you, who do you got to call? Yeah, I don't know. Ghostbusters. <laughs> I, I was thinking that. <laughs> I was going to say it. Yeah. Uh, mm. Anyway. Mm. You know, we had a little Torah talk earlier. We talked about Deuteronomy 12. Yes. Deuteronomy 12 is very relevant to what we're doing around this time of year because they're out there buying trees right now. Do they have trees set up on lots with lights and trees that they're selling people? Yep. Wow. Yeah. And uh, right. you look at the shops now, that they bring out these, I don't know if they have them over there, they have these $2 shops where they're just massive shops and everything's, they're not $2, but you know they call them $2 shops and everything is just so cheap for for yeah. the demographic of people that can't afford anything and they go and they go and you look at these you just look in them and there's just tinsel and trees and they're all plastic and so even if you don't want to go out and do the traditional thing you can still have the idol in your house and they've made it accessible for everybody and uh, our whole street is lit up <laughs> it's just Houses covered with, over here, a street, certain streets will compete against each other. So every single house will try and cover. You remember that old Chevy Chase movie where he tries and puts lights over his whole house? Remember oh, that? I love that show. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't like this topic, but I really enjoy some of the scenes. Yeah, so they, they're yeah. doing that over here. They're trying to light up everything, every single inch of their house to try to light up. So I opened my son's window and I was saying goodnight to him the other night, and I said, look at all the lights out there. I said, they're pretty, aren't they? And he gave me this weird look, like, because he wasn't allowed to say they're pretty. I said, they are, they're pretty, aren't they? He said, yeah. I said, there's only one problem. He said, they're naughty. I said, yeah. I said, you who hates it. <laughs> so, I want to get a newspaper that, uh, you know, the big, the giant mega circus that's down the street from us. 
Uh, I pray for them every day, Southeast. And uh, they put out a newspaper every week. I want to go get it. It'll just take me about a few seconds. Yeah. Hey, where's that? Okay, it was in the other room. And uh, anyway, I want to read this to you real quick. This is a really strange spin on this whole thing, the Christmas tree thing. But this article right here says, Specially decorated trees help little ones understand the meaning of Christmas. And it says, a After Misty Yates finished decorating her Christmas tree several years ago, she stood back and was unsatisfied. It needed something. So anyway, here's what they did. They started dressing these things. Oh, there they are, putting a huge one up. It looks like it's about 40 feet, a 40 footer going up with a steel frame. But um, this is what she uh, are doing. She did. There's all these pictures of uh, the, it, this is the Christmas tree, and then they put this burka at the top, and there's uh, they're turning them into people. These, here's a tree and another tree, and you you see the trees, yeah. and there are people. They've turned them into people. <laughs> oh boy and that's uh, with the objective of helping little ones understand the meaning of Christmas yeah. Yeah. I don't get it what's the connection you're talking about? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. and that's what they're doing down there But it's right here in their newspaper it's on the front page and several pages inside and, you know it's <laughs> so high you know yeah. I was wondering what the Christmas tree had to do with, I mean, it's called a Christmas tree, but what does Christmas have to do with the Messiah? Mm -hmm. a Christos is one component of the word, and that is Greek, and it means anointed one. Christos is one component of the word, and that is Greek, and it means anointed one. Or anointed, and then you also have that the fact that it's related to a deity that may or may not be his name, but you know the Romans worshipped uh, some pagan deity uh, that basically his name meant good, or you know, and then the second part of Christmas is Mas, and Mas is Latin, mm -hmm. and it means mm -hmm. depart. You know, you're dismissed. You know. So anointed <laughs> is departing. Anointed one is departing. Uh, uh, or, it's, right? or it's telling him to go away. Uh, yeah. Anointed depart. That's what it's saying in two different languages. It's so odd. Wow. And and I haven't actually found out where where that word started. You know, I should know, but there probably isn't going to be a trackable way of finding that, that out. It's just a. It's just one of those mysteries. Somebody built the word at some point, and the person that did it is unknown. You know, like they send you a poem or a song, and the author is unknown. You know, but uh, you know, whoever did do that, who knows what they were thinking? Because surely they knew what those words meant. You know, and how would that have to do? What would that have to do with the nativity, or? You know, but the nativity was already celebrated and observed by the pagans for well the last three thousand years or so, because it was called the Natila, Natalis Sol Invictus, which was you know basically the unconquerable the the birth of the unconquerable son you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so the word nativity was okay I guess, but uh, it wasn't about, well, you know, the only people that observed birthdays, though, were heathens. You know, the, the Pharaoh is mentioned as observing his birthday, which isn't an example for any of us. No one else did that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you don't ever read about uh, anyone observing their birthday again until the book of Eob or Job, where his children were observing, uh, they were having a celebration on their day. On their day, each one on their day, and they, they would invite the other brothers and sisters to their home on their day and have a celebration. And Eob is over there, um, you know, offering sacrifices for the sin that they're obviously mm -hmm. committing, or possible sins that they're committing 
if it's offensive. But nowhere is anybody commanded to observe their birthday. But the birthday of, of a person is most special to which to a witch. It's the highest. It's the most important day to a witch. That's interesting. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, we have that going on. And then I think there was another birthday, too, wasn't there? Uh, I think it was Herod. I think we yes. read. And on his birthday, they were calling him an Elohim and saying, mm -hmm. this is not a man. This is Elohim. And then, bam, he was struck down, you know. Guts came in. Yeah. And he was digging that, you know. Mm. He liked it. Mm. So birthdays in the scriptures, if you're looking for them, they're there. But you, but there's not any birthday about the Messiah. I mean, like, they weren't getting together uh, at any point in, uh, in any of the prophets' lives or any person. Was so, no, none of them were celebrating their birthday, you know, mm. except for the children of Eo. And that was a bad thing because, you know, things were like storms were coming along and carrying them away. In fact, uh, what about, uh, oh, and uh, Rebecca on the phone last night, she, she chatted with me for an hour. There was a lot of material that she was drawing in and, and, and drawing on and bringing up. And she said, well, do you believe in a trinity? And I said, well, if you could find it in the scriptures, uh, I would certainly be welcome to and open-minded about it, but I found a trinity in the scriptures that isn't really from a good a good source. It's uh, 2 Kings 4, verse 42. You know, and it's during the, the exploits of Elisha, you know. And there's this Canaanite city that's named B-A-A-L Shalisha. Yeah. <laughs> which uh, Shalisha, if you remember back when we had our uh, explanation of the days of the week, the days of the week, the first day is Yom Akkad, or day one, and day two is Yom Shani, and day three is Yom Shalish, or Yom Shalisha. Mm -hmm. So you got Shalisha, or Shalosh, which means three. So Yom, uh, B A A L, Shalisha. <laughs> you know, that's the trinity of uh, pagan religion and the Canaanite people. Yeah. Named, they named a city that, yeah, yeah. or a town. So, uh, you know, I, and I mentioned that to her, you know, that, well, there is a trinity in there, but I think it's uh, not, a, not coming from a good place. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know that, you know, the, all, the, all the pagan formats have trinities, you know. They don't like it when you talk about trinities, do they? <laughs> I don't even understand why that comes up. They, they really do. See, because people are saying, well, this person really is different from me. And, and then they, they look for things that are very dear to their heart that they've been told are vital to salvation. And, of course, Scripture doesn't ever say anywhere in there that you must believe in the trinity because it's vital to your salvation. But you hear it coming out of their pulpits. I've had uh, many radio programs that I've listened to where they say, man, there's no chance. You can't make it if you don't believe in the Trinity. I guess you have too. <laughs> Haven't you heard him say that? Yeah, Yeah. my brother-in-law said to me, and you still don't believe in the Trinity, do you? I said, well, it's not really in Scripture, uh, that word. <laughs> or the teaching. Or the, the teaching. Teach. Uh, so, yeah. You know, when you read the Shema, and it's, uh, it says, Hear, O Yisrael, Yahuwah, your Elohim. Yahuwah is one. If he wanted us to think it was three, or he's three, or four, or, you know, 50, then he would have had that perfect opportunity. But he, but he always maintains that he has one name, and he is one being, you know. But... Um, People have trouble with that. Anyway, that was a, you know, but people do tend to, they, they're programmed with these things. You know, they're com it's coming from outside Scripture. Mm -hmm. and, but they read uh, the book of Matthew and, or Matthew, and they see, they see that you're to immerse them in the name of the Father 
and the sun and the Ruach HaKodesh, and they overlook the fact that the name is one thing. There's only one name. Hmm. You know, that's the point that they seem to overlook easily. Now, if it said names, plural, of the Father and the Son and the Ruach HaKodesh, then they'd all have different names, you know. Hmm. But uh, anyway, that's that, that whole thing started with Constantine as well. Yeah. And the councils. So, uh, anyway, we're not condemning anybody at all. No. We're just, it's just, uh, let's let's not uh, add stuff in there and let's, let's not take anything away. You don't need to add anything. It's just very exciting because everybody knows that there's something wrong. The Christians know that there's, you know, most of them, and most people are unfulfilled. They know there's something wrong. We we were like that too. We we're like, you can never get to the end of it. You can never get free. You can, you never seem to overcome. There's always something, some other hoop you've got to jump through. Yeah. You know? So, you, you're waiting for the big breakthrough. Hmm. Uh, when actually, what you need to do is you need to put down all this baggage and say, hmm. let's just not do that. Let's just. What would happen if we just didn't do the Christmas thing? We didn't do the Halloween thing. Actually, with us, it started with Halloween because we were, uh, you know, listening to. We were Christians, and we were listening to radio and uh, various things, and we were hearing about Satanists who were converted to Christianity, and they had to do very little to change. Actually, all they had to do was just. You know, uh, they, they, they were basically doing the same thing, although they weren't crawling on Satan anymore. But uh, they were uh, basically opening up people's eyes to the fact that Halloween is an evil thing, you know, and where its origins came from. You know, that it was a Roman Catholic uh, adopted item from the Norse pagan religions, you know, and the pumpkins and candles and all these represent these represented things, you know. And they were very bad, mm. so we uh, we stopped doing that. And of course, the night is uh, it's nighttime. I mean, why are your children out at night? And yeah. you know, yeah. it's just not good. But uh, those things are uh, beginning points. And then when we discovered about what the origins of Christmas really were, and of course the Bunny Rabbit Festival, uh, and and of course Sunday, it was just uh, you know. It was heartbreaking, but we got through that. But you see, he was giving us his point of view instead of our using ours. So we weren't doing everything according to what was right in our own eyes. And I hadn't even read that scripture in Deuteronomy 12, you know, but we were just still in the Christian mindset, you know. And we were still meeting with the Christians and going, how can they stand and have that tree over there, you know? They put a tree inside the building, you know, yeah. in the meeting halls. You know. yeah. I think the children are out now. I'm going to have to break up the little love fest. <laughs> what about the Sheila's? Are the Sheila's going to be here? Yeah, I'm going to go uh, switch, switch, switch sides. All right. Go after the kids. I'll go get. I'll go get Phyllis. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. I'll see you later, brother. Okay. Bye bye now. Bye bye. <laughs>